this is a great segue to go to, I think, to the audience. Yeah. After I <laughs> oh, <laughs> explain what has just come right? before this. Uh, I neglected to do this at the beginning. My apologies to the Planning Commission. I promised I would, and I'm going to do it now. This has actually been part of a three-part process that has been the result of a collaboration between us, the City Program, the Vancouver Planning Commission, the School of Community and Regional Planning. Dare I miss anybody? Oh, uh, City Conversation. Can't miss that. And given this process, the 60 people who came together with many backgrounds and experience, the City Conversation that brought Marguerite Ford and Peter Ladner to talk on this, this is going to continue. But tonight we want to engage you. You've heard from the past planners. Now is an opportunity for you to ask your questions, but also to make your comments, because we're going to be keeping track of this. This is part of an ongoing process. And I'd like to begin actually by asking uh, Penny Gerstein of the School of Community and Regional Planning whether in fact she has a question to lead us off with. Please do go to the mic and I'll ask all of you to do that. Uh, I know you'll be able to get in any other comments you want to make in response to, I'm sure, the questions that will come forward. Right. So, Penny. So, yeah. so thank you. Um, I, while I was listening, I was wondering whether we could clone all of you together and maybe we'd make a, <laughs> it would make a really good uh, new uh, head of planning, <laughs> whatever we call that. Um, what I, it, As a segue into what uh, Gordon was talking about, I just wanted to preface what I'm going to ask. Um, we in the uh, in October 13th we had we we brought together uh, a group of people. Um, many of you are actually in this room today, and uh, students uh, from the School of Community and Regional Planning at UBC um, to sort of do a. Uh, a kind of a, a think tank on on what is our principles and and values that have that are guiding us um, and we came up with a number of them which are going to be on the Vancouver City uh, uh, Planning Commission website and also in Scarb's website um, and um, but you know what what came from that was really a sense of um, you know that that there was these strong sort of of, of things that really did guide us. Um, and I think a lot of the people in the room were telling us stories of what happened in terms of the planning processes that kind of really developed those principles. And so what I would like to ask you is, you know, what are, you know, each, you know, if you were um, given the opportunity to actually uh, ask uh, of the, uh, you know, if you're given the opportunity to, um, you know, uh, to to provide uh, kind of guidance to whoever is selected uh, by telling them what you really feel are our sort of uh, uh, values are you know what what are the values that have sort of really guided Vancouver in in terms of your perspective and how that would affect um, them as uh, in their new role. Now that would be worthy of an hour's worth of discussion. <laughs> so let me, if I can, uh, Penny, just say what would be the first piece of advice with respect to what Penny has asked that you would give? Let's say to the mayor. I wouldn't answer the question because I think that's the point. I, I would ask the citizens of Vancouver the question. You see, we haven't really asked the citizens of Vancouver in living memory the question. We've sort of assumed things. And we, we had a process, we had an extraordinary process of city planning. You cannot forget about this process. It involved tens of thousands of people. It asked all kinds of questions. It was not confusing. It was very clear. And it went to people who have never been involved in planning before. But how long ago was that? 20 years. It was 20 years ago. We've got, and look at all the people in this room. They're coming to see a bunch of has-beens. Why? Because people in this town, I think, want to talk about this town. They want to talk about their values. And I would say the first thing we have to do to tell that planner is to go out and meet the Vancouverites and ask the Vancouverites, what are those values? That's what I would say. And I wouldn't try to, to, to take the place of that, really, to be honest. One word, listen. And maybe two words, learn. And then lead. <laughs> Any more? No. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure this is the most important thing, but it's the thing that I want to say at this particular moment. I would say to 
not just the has-beens up here, but the has-beens in the room, in, in, in the audience. Um, we have to crush this narrative that's been started recently that, um, that ex-planners should shut up. There's been a narrative that said, that started in that some, some smart, young, passionate planners uh, from my former staff have even said it to me and I said, what are you saying? This no, the, the phrase is, uh, we eat our young in Vancouver has been brought up. It, in other words, the past planners are critical of some things the new planners are doing. And uh, our current chief planner, at least for another week, has said that this is a real problem. Uh, I had this challenge when I was at City Hall. I used to joke that I couldn't swing a stick without hitting a former director of planning or a chief planner with a strong opinion on everything I was doing. But I had tremendous, res I started with the, the, the perspective of tremendous respect for the work that the people before me had done. And I had the benefit of some people like Rhonda and Trish and, and Rob Jenkins and such who were part of passing that forward to me. So this narrative that uh, the ex-planner should shut up, I, I've got a real concern about. I appreciate uh, that past generations still cared so much about this city that they were still highly engaged and, and uh, sometimes got upset about things that moved too far away from principles or what have you. So I would say to the mayor, to the chief planner, you might not always agree. I've disagreed with the people on this panel at times. Uh, but I always started with a strong position of appreciating them still being actively engaged, that I could learn from them. It was a tremendous benefit to me. Okay, so, guys. So keep eating your young, if that's the phrase. Speed it up, because yeah. we've got a lot of people out yeah, there yeah. who want to raise their own points of view. I'm going to go back, though, and get a quick comment from, again, Anne and Ray. No? Okay. In thinking, because since leaving the city, I've worked in a lot of other cities, not as intensively as Larry, more sort of flit in, flit out. But I suddenly realized what I didn't really know when I worked in Vancouver, how lucky we are to work in a city with a charter, which means that the city council can actually enact change. And almost everywhere else I've been working, decisions, even in Ontario, can be appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board. In Auckland, decisions Council can't make the final decision. It goes to Wellington, the capital. Just fancy sending all our city council plans to Ottawa or to Victoria for approval. So what I would say to the director is, you have the ability to do in Vancouver things that other cities can't do because it is in the control of the city in conjunction with the region. Great opportunity, which doesn't occur in many parts of the world. Before we go, I, I want to use this opportunity to say that my recommendation to the mayor would be to put pressure as much as you can as a leader of the community to get more coverage in all media possible, particularly those that reach the most people, in order to have a conversation that is possible because people have a common understanding of the issues. I raise that because I neglected to note that Francis Biola was part of the city conversation. I know I've seen Karen Krangle here from Novus Res Service. Anybody else? Any other blogger, mainstream media, reporter, electronic, print? Anybody? We'll find out when we look at our Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can be pretty confident that they're not here. They can't afford to or they no longer have an interest in covering this. Now, I say that with a certain amount of self-interest, obviously. But I've noticed even from the time that I've lived in this city that the possibility of having a common conversation because people have somewhere to go to at least have a common read or a common understanding of the facts has evaporated. It makes it very difficult when social media uh, particularly drive agendas in the way that they do. And that, I think, remains a singular problem. We can't have that conversation if people don't have at least a common set of understandings. So, here first. Thank you. Um, I guess that's a great segue for me in terms of what happens after this evening. So we have a great conversation. We um, walk away from here with no outcome that's transmitted to the city council. 
So I've got a suggestion. Um, with your advice and your comment, and perhaps the audience, there are a lot of professionals in the audience, uh, that we come up with some kind of statement or uh, message for the City Council. And I'd like to make a suggestion that perhaps we could talk about the public interest. It's a phrase that um, planners speak of with radish, but hasn't been mentioned once. So what about the public interest and how is it protected? How do you retain the autonomy of the director of planning? What is the message for City Hall? Why are we even talking about a manager who is to implement as opposed to a director who is to give direction and vision? So maybe there's something here that we could send as a strong message, as an outcome for this meeting, other than yada, 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 that we would like to see autonomy for the director of planning who reports directly to the mayor of council. Could you comment, please? Well, I have to say that I always felt it was better when the director of planning had at least the right to speak directly to council, even if the city manager didn't like it. And I know that uh, in Ray's day, you had that right. And it was a very important right because it meant that you could give your best advice. They didn't like it, they didn't like it. You could uh, articulate something that other people could cluster around. You could work with a lot of people and bring a collective message forward. So I think that was a good thing. I don't know if we're all ready to write some sort of manifesto to send to the city council about the chief planner. Um, but I, I do believe that the uh, ability of the planner to be able to speak her or his mind honestly, directly, uh, uh, is important. I actually think it's more important out in the community rather than just at the city council. Just check, the Vancouver City Planning Commission will be sending a report based upon what they've heard and additional information to city council as part of their mandate. That seems to me to be a pretty reasonable thing to do in the way that you've articulated. I'd just say that all of us have, have used the word or, or, or similar words to the word culture. And I personally have never gotten all that fussed about the title. I like the term chief planner. You know, Jen in, in Toronto is called the GM too, but her main title is chief planner. And that's the shorthand we all used anyway. And, uh, so you can call it tuna fish for all I care. What's important is the culture of, 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 of uh, how planning uh, is positioned within City Hall. Okay, we're gonna ask a few more people to come forward. Just before they do, uh, Ray raised this question. I wonder, does the city really matter as much as it did? I think the answer to that is self-evident when you look at the region. But can the city be the leader of the region in a way that it assumed it could and did in the past? Um, I think it's inappropriate for it to believe that it has all the knowledge with just the citizens of the no, city. No, no, but that's different from providing the leadership. Uh, any municipality could provide good leadership. Any municipality. I don't see that the city is the core of the region and therefore symbolically the centre and should be showing the best leadership and used to do. Uh, but um, even in the, the old days, there was a sense that the city was more important than the in the city. And I'm saying that's got to change because uh -huh. yeah, we've got to support the region. Yeah. No? I'm, I believe that the next generation, the young planners that are just in this room who are just learning, that the focus won't be on the city of Vancouver as much as it's been in the past. Uh, in a way, our generation fought the battle of the dying city, core city, and we sort of won the battle in a way. But what's out there now is where 60% of Canadians live is out in those suburbs, those suburban communities. And the great invention of, to transform the city to be sustainable and livable is actually going to happen out there. So what I'm hoping is that you will see uh, spontaneous fires of creativity out there in the suburban setting to challenge most of the ways those suburbs have been put together. I would like to see them have the kind of charter that we enjoy because Anne is right, it allowed us to do many things in Vancouver that you couldn't do anywhere else and that kind of you know motivated us. But 
uh, even in the absence of that, there's nothing better than a good idea and a strong constituency around it. And I think that we're going to see that uh, with the new generation because their dedication to the green city is important, but also most of them really are suburbanites. And they've got to take the green agenda to the suburbs, and they've got to transform those suburbs. And frankly, if they don't do that, we're all in trouble. Uh, the core cities are, you know, we, we're just polishing the diamond, as it were. There is one other real trouble that I'm seeing. I've actually been doing some work in some smaller communities in BC and been shocked by comments that, by staff, that we can't, by law, talk to council if we have more than two or three councillors in the room. It's deemed a council meeting. And I saw that in the newspaper recently oh gosh, with yes. some discussion. I've got to say that certainly while we were directors, I must have sat down with council once or you know every couple of weeks talking about whatever the major project was that was underway, sort of sharing, growing, learning together. And I see real problem coming up for planning if indeed all discussion has to take place just in the council chamber and there can't be that growing and sharing. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I have to say, absolutely share that with you. If the American Sunshine Law mm. is assumed to be relevant or required, and we've, I can't think of a better re recipe for very quick dysfunction. I don't see any federal or provincial governments who don't talk to their staff. They do it all in private. This gentleman's been trying to talk. Yeah, yeah I know. Can I just say this, quickly? This I, I, I've had a, I'm asking you to move along quickly. I, I played a role in the new regional plan, and I'd say that any chief planner of Vancouver and any mayor of Vancouver can play a leadership role, but it has to be done in a, in a very careful, respectful way. Because if you go out and say, I'm, yeah. I'm from Vancouver and I know best, you're, you're, you're it's another bloodbath. I believe toast is the word, yeah. Mm. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I've heard it been said on a couple occasions that uh, cities in Canada can't make the changes they need to make because they don't get the percentage of the tax dollar that they should get. And so, uh, you know, it reminds me of things that happen, say, in Vancouver, such as having to leverage various developments for amenities because if they can't be afforded in other, say, what might have historically been uh, standard methods. So my question would be, more importantly than getting the right person as the director of planning, is it more important or as important even uh, to perhaps look at the latest federal election and look at opportunities with working differently with the federal government to make change in cities the way we want? Lots there. Yeah. I would definitely agree with that. Some of the most successful work that certainly I did in the early years with council was when CMHC, the national government, was providing funds for co-ops and nonprofit housing. In this country, we have never address the issue of the balance between responsibility and resources. More and more responsibilities either get turned down or get picked up, and at the same time, the resources aren't being redirected. I'm not sure I see an opportunity, but I certainly think the new director needs to understand urban economics, finances, and what it might take to get a better balance between responsibility and resources. I think, though, your idea that one is more important than the other is where, where I have a difficulty. I agree with everything that's, that uh, Anna said, but I've got to tell you this. In America, uh, <clears throat> cities get eight times what Canadian cities get out of the federal government, and they waste it because they don't have leadership in those cities, and they're spending it on more freeways and a bunch of junk. They give 10 or 12 million to every new building that comes up to kind of motivate them to build the buildings. There's a lot of wastage. It's not about just more money. It's about spending it on the right things and doing the right things. And I think that's where your chief planner becomes an agent for a community to determine what's right. So I think it's equally important. It, the best thing is when you have a great chief planner, a great planning organization, a wonderful community, and a lot of dough. <laughs> That's a good thing. But don't wait. Don't hold your breath. I'm, I'm excited about the federal government change, but the provincial government is still a challenge. And you needn't look past the example of the day after council made an incredibly bold decision on the viaducts. Todd Stone 
calls a press uh, calls a press conference and says, "Whoa, uh, the 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 sheer dysfunction of that relationship staggers me." Um, and so, uh, work needs to be done. Irresistibly, I, <laughs> I can't help but note uh, for the young ones, prepare yourself for Freeway Fight 2.0 as it manifests itself. The province doesn't spend billions of dollars in every direction to build massive roads and bridges up to the borders of Vancouver and then think that they'll stop there. Just a note. Neil. Thank, thank you so much for this. this is wonderful. And I, thank you, Gord, for all you've done with the city program, for all you've given back to the city, for all that you've done oh. to raise the level of conversation in the city. Thank I, you, I, Neil. I cannot thank you enough. <laughs> On that note, uh, I was very fortunate as part of uh, being part of the Vancouver City Planning Commission to be part of that conversation a few weeks ago that, that Penny so thoughtfully brought up. And the, what struck me was how quickly folks from all sorts of backgrounds coalesced on what they identified as values and principles. And the, and the words just resonated. They were so easy. Collaboration, respect for place, respect for environment, respect for economy, inclusiveness, all these things that are such a part of our city. But with the challenge that you faced, and I'm sure the next uh, folks will too, how do you balance between a deep respect for that, those principles, the culture of this place, and the need to move the dial further, to bring in new ideas, new innovation, and challenge our communities and our city? I'd like to just say one thing about that. Don't take 60 people or 100 people or 200 people or 5,000 people or 10,000 people as enough because those are all self-selected people. They're, they're junkies. You're all junkies <laughs> about planning. What we have to reach out is to the people who've never thought about planning. They have their own ideas. And we have to find techniques that work with those people. You know, we found, for example, with people where English was a difficulty in, down in Dallas uh, with the H Hispanic community that we had these design surrets where we never talked. We just drew stuff and we made images and we talked through our images. We have to reach out to tens of thousands uh, of people. Um, having said that, I'm finding everywhere in the world, and this is what, it, I, I just did this book and, and what we did in our book is that we found amazing examples of where things made it through the horrible processes and still got built and became exemplars to all of us. And I think we have to tag into those a lot more, learn about them, you know, visit them, bring those ideas back, and then transform them to work in our place. Uh, and I think that's a, a good way to move forward. My experience is that most of the people that are within our culture know a lot of the answers for the future city. The problem is that consumers don't agree with us. Can I add at that point that um, one of the ideas in this community for a long time has been something called urbanarium. Has anybody heard of urbanarium? <laughs> okay, well, if you think of what urbanarium is supposed to do and it hasn't done, it's because City Hall hasn't done it and doesn't do it. And that is it has a place where you can go and get information that you can understand, like in a form which is easy to understand, that tells you about what the city's doing, why it's doing it, and how it's doing it, and also assesses what's happening all the time. It's there all the time. It's not one plan, it's not one process. It's there all the time. And it grows respect because what it does is try to tell you the truth as far as reasonable people can put it out, including the alternatives that are available. The thing that's wrong with the plan when it becomes a plan is somehow got rid of the fact that it's got to be flexible the very day it's built. So we need a system of being able to find out what is happening in the city without talking to people who are promoting their own single idea, but bringing issues out, bringing what other people think out, informing you about what the community thinks. And we haven't got that. Uh, I agree that what Gordon is doing here it's very significant. There's not enough of it, but he keeps building on it, or <coughs> other people build on it too. And that's so important to do. That's more important fact than many of the other techniques we've been talking about. But we haven't got it. We could start at here, though, you see. So those things start and ferment. And I certainly can't forget Michael Alexander of the City Conversation Program. Michael. 
Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for what I what I think is the most frank conversation, public conversation that I have heard in the eight years that I've uh, been here. I think it validated the idea that we had the politicians at, at City Conversations two, uh, two weeks ago, and we had the former planners, but very much still planners, uh, here tonight. It really opened up uh, the conversation. Thank you for your frankness. Um, I think that Gord was exactly right that when the four of you were working, uh, essentially you were working on the easy parts of the city. Um, there are a few brownfield, greenfields uh, uh, perhaps left, the viaducts, the Jericho lands, maybe Little Mountain. But you could go and talk with every one of the 650,000 people in Vancouver and get every one of them to open up enough to give you what they want, what they think. And you would be still missing a lot of people. And those are the people who want to be here, are coming here eventually, but have no voice here. Who speaks for them? It's a nice statement too, thank you. The, yeah. the, I think the other important thing is that we've got to think about the people who aren't here can't come because they're not born here. And this is even more important that we deal with those. And we're not dealing with those because we're still concentrating on the immediate issues all the time. And so we've got to expand that discussion so we all sense the responsibility of what happens when we do or do not do what we're doing in order to create a future for everybody. When we were trying to have the conversation about change in the rest of the city, the, the, the non-easy parts, uh, a lot of the narrative was about future generations. It was about people who couldn't come. Uh, we were planning for, a, we were talking about a population that didn't exist yet, and we got criticized for that. You know, how dare you um, uh, put on equal footing these people that don't exist yet or aren't here yet? put on equal footing to, the, to those of us who are already in the city. And that's a very tough conversation to have. I firmly have always believed that when you're planning for the future, by definition, that means you're planning, when you're thinking about climate change, you're talking about future generations. When you're thinking about growth, you're talking about future residents and such. And that's the job of the planner to look at all of those. But what I've realized and, and, and is, is it's a tough conversation and can lead to, and if you don't do it artfully and sensitively, you can make a lot of people mad that, that, that local residents uh, are somehow not being respected. There's absolutely a way to do it, though. And I, I, I'm, I'm better at it every day, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, and it's critically important, but it's sure not easy. Larry? First thing, your idea of what's easy and my idea of what's easy <laughs> seem very different. Because it was pretty hard, it's just so you'll know. Different. It was <laughs> pretty hard, <laughs> but we did do it. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is we should acknowledge you and your leadership this week in doing something very extraordinary, which is getting rid of those damn viaducts. So congratulations on great leadership, Thank Michael, you. and that, along with a lot of other people. What I want to say about this is that in any engagement process, you're always going to have the people of the future that you have to find a way to get into the conversation. You're always going to have the outsiders you have to find a way to get in the conversation. And there are many kinds of techniques to use that. I commend you to look at the planning that's going on in Amsterdam right now, where what they're doing is they're reaching out to the, literally to the entire world through the social media to really begin to bring the vision of people who would like to come to Amsterdam in the future, people who uh, you know, or can talk uh, about uh, educators that can talk about what young people are talking about, that all kinds of people are being brought into that equation. Unfortunately, most of our techniques don't even try that. Most of our techniques are very 19th century, <laughs> you know, or very 1950s, actually. Yeah. Uh, and most of our techniques get a few people in a room like this and say, yeah, they all agree with us, or they don't agree with us, and that's the end of the story. We have just fabulous techniques we can use now. We're all giving you Twitter, a set of stickies to put on the wall. On Twitter, yeah. Twitter. Uh -huh. <laughs> just give you a quick example of how we brought people of the future into discussions in communities in Vancouver. Everybody almost now has a cell phone. 
everybody has a picture of relatives, children if they're older, um, the newborn baby. It's amazing how in discussions people pass those around and how in those discussions thinking about some of those people um, who are the future brings everybody in the room to thinking about the future. The one that works very well in the room, as Larry says, is the question about how do you engage a much wider group. Auckland did almost all of their new plan using the web. Now, that was great because everybody had equal access to information to the draft plan. It did have a downside. When we looked at who had actually engaged, as I recall, about 60% of the comments were from 11 people who did nothing other than keep writing in. <laughs> and so you do have to watch that your conversation, if you're doing it um, through social media, is indeed reaching a broad group. So you have to do some tests on that, which Auckland did. And that's, I think, uh, an opportunity for future planners, how connected we are. I worry that if the connections, however, aren't at some point face to face, we didn't notice in Auckland that people, people tend to be listening to blogs of people they agreed with. The challenge is to make sure that you're listening to other people and sharing those different directions and sort of debating, arguing about what the choices are that face the city. And that's what we found. I still haven't found a way to get off of face-to-face -face is an adequate way of actually addressing some of, having people change their minds, address those choices. Thank you. Let me add a very brief corollary. When you're planning a neighborhood, the people from the neighborhood come, the people who feel most invested in the neighborhood come. But how does that, but how do the, do the needs of the city get balanced by the need, by what they perceive as the needs of the neighborhood and they stop thinking about being, being citizens of the city? Let me tell you how City Plan did that. City Plan gave some broad directions for the city. <coughs> the neighborhood went and planned, but we had a group called the City Hats or the City Perspectives Panel. They were people from other neighborhoods who participated in your neighborhood planning, but were in a position to say, hey, 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 if you don't take your share, it falls on our neighborhood. That's not fair. So there are ways to engage a broader city perspective in a local discussion. Plus, I believe that's just the planner's role. The planner yeah. listens to thousands of voices every day, not just the voices in their head. Um, and, and balances, but the, the, the part that many planning processes are not good at is they'll listen, they'll, they'll invite a room like you, you'll tell us what you think, and then uh, we may make a decision, and we're not good at explaining to the group who's just said something like this, how the decision was made that balanced not only the voices in this room, but all the other voices, all the other perspectives. We don't show our work like my fourth grade math teacher used to say. We just give the answer. And that's, that's pretty bad communication, and, and it leads to people saying, you didn't listen, which is often just code for you didn't do what we told you to do. Thank you. It's been really informative to have such a knowledgeable group together here. Uh, at some point, you've all touched on the importance of public engagement as well as uh, the influence or pressure from council. So what qualities do you think a uh, chief planner and the planning leadership should have in negotiating that tension uh, within the context of significant growth in Vancouver? And on the engagement side, I'd like to add that I'm the fourth person to ask a question, and I'm the fourth white man to ask a question. <laughs> Just so, you, just so you know, in most, in most engagement programs that have any credibility, first things, they will be done in multiple languages. They will be done in languages that reflect um, the, the profile of the community that you're in or the, the people that would be interested. Uh, and almost all the work that we do in Dallas, for example, we do things in Spanish and English because that you have to. 
Uh, second thing is I've never seen a, a public engagement program that wasn't layered with many different techniques, and the mm -hmm. truth tends to pop out from all of those techniques. It's not just one thing. Unfortunately, a lot of planners have taken public engagement down to the point of being very rote. I have two ways of doing it. If you don't like my way, that's your problem. Thirdly, we don't really design public engagement for the people who are engaging. We design it for our convenience. So we do it at the wrong time. We do it with the wrong arrangements in the wrong setting. We have no supports. The best thing we do is offer a cup of coffee when maybe what we need to offer is childcare. Um, in, in some work we did in, in a very modest income neighborhood in Washington, D.C., we actually paid everyone to come. Everyone who came got paid. Just the same we got paid because, you know what, their, their time was very valuable when they made $6 an hour. So there's many kinds of techniques, but planners, we went through a period where public engagement was very creative, and then we went through a period where I find public engagement got very uncreative. Walking it got around, very looking rote. at some... And in fact, in some cities, the public engagement methods are now institutionalized in laws, mm -hmm. and you can't do anything else. Um, but the beauty of your generation is that you have a way around that. You know, you can do what they did in Egypt, what they've done elsewhere. You can get into social media and you can talk to people regardless of what authorities are saying. And you can find ways to reach people that haven't been reached before. And I think that's magical and it has great potential. You raised an interesting point just at the time I was thinking about it. Um, and you got two more white guys behind you. <laughs> what should we do? But one is older. Well, yeah, but what should we do? <laughs> Doesn't look I that old. I think we should just let people speak. <laughs> well, uh, we could ask, uh, have a 50 50 balance. <laughs> is it too much to ask? Surely someone else? Let everyone talk the way they wish. That's not making the way we want it. Yeah. Well, we'll see what kind of activity there was on Twitter afterwards. Yeah. Uh, as a facilitator, you see, you try, you make an effort to do something, and you get blowback. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it works. Uh, yeah, the old white guy. <laughs> You're the youngest you don't look that old to me, to be honest. Oh, you're very kind. Um, and I'm probably the one that's not eligible to be here because I actually am not from here. I work in the mayor's office in, in Coquitlam. And who might you be, actually? And, um, that's why I had the nerve to say <laughs> <laughs> He's my mayor. And one of my constituents is one of your panelists. Yes. Um, but I, I, do, I do actually, Coquitlam are probably the residents who think the viaducts were built for them. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, we're... I guess I'm really wondering, and I really appreciate Mr. Spaxman's acknowledgement that uh, people in public life are, are people too. Um, how do we, what do, what do we do when, um, we know what happens when, when the planners are perceived to be wrong, council votes them down. Uh, what happens when the politicians are wrong? Um, because that happens too. Um, but also, what do we do with the region? What do we do with the rest of, there was some acknowledgement that the rest of the region is where a lot of this is going to take place. Uh, Coquitlam is burgeoning, Surrey is burgeoning, the center of gravity for development is moving eastward, and, and how does Vancouver's choice of a planner uh, matter? The, the only thing I think the planner has to be is that he recognizes the importance of the region, and he has to bring that forward. Uh, at the same time, I think everybody is beginning to recognize more what's happening in the region, and we'll give the, I know the new regional planners there, and I've met the to talk about this very thing, they are very keen and interested in beginning to lead at the regional level as well. And they have, like, these questions come up for them that they're trying to deal with now. Is our responsibility as planners more to the council that runs the region, or is it to the people of the region? Which is an interesting dilemma. Uh, but nevertheless, they are considering also. What do we do about globalization as it affects this region? What do we do, because this has been the focus of my question to them, is how can you allocate densities uh, of people to different parts of this region and then find the region, have, the individual can have their own opinion about that, 
and vary what you say? And how do you bring forward the debate at the regional level about the impact of putting a population in the wrong place, or not knowing what impact the density that you propose for somebody will actually have in the built form? So what we're getting to is the complexity there is for a planner to be able to see the detail, to see the generality, to see the problem socially and politically, and behave as adroitly as he possibly can, or she possibly can, with the council or the region that they're dealing with. And it's not a process that you solve overnight, but what you do is you hang on to the, the shifts of the turbo curling. And I think there are shifts occurring in this community at the regional level and the local level, particularly at the local level, which if um, expressed as well as people can make it, and then join in it, will affect and change the way government operates. I also think that, that a strong, um, articulate planner, no matter where they're working, if they're providing leadership, should be talking about the implications at all levels, the neighborhood level, their city level, the regional level, some other city in the region's level. You may not be able to take a recommendation to another council, but you can speak in public about it. You can inspire other people to think about it, worry about it. You can form informal liaisons and combinations of people to attack certain kinds of issues. Um, and I think through that, you can start to make some progress. You can find allies who feel the same way. I feel, for example, that that's one of the big things we need to do for affordable housing right now. Uh, there's, a, there's been an inclination historically to say the affordable housing has to kind of be handled by the core city because that's where the poor people tend to be. But, you know, that's changing in our, in our region. And we need a kind of a, a, a collaboration or a collegium of answers. I think every planner can talk about the various levels and then they'll act where they have the authority to act. And otherwise, it's the authority of influence. And I would say that I'm already seeing a lot more leadership from other communities when the last um, iteration of the regional growth strategy happened. It was your municipality, Mayor Stewart, who actually stood up and said, some of these ways this is going to be managed don't work and challenged the region and had that, I think, very fruitful discussion which improved everybody's understanding of how the new regional plan would work. So, Presently, Greg Moore chairing the region. I see a lot more happening in the suburban areas, and I think Vancouver, you know, maybe other than the transit referendum where there's a bit of discussion, has stepped back a bit. And so I think a lot's happening in the region that once you've got the evergreen line, everybody else will be able to go and see. <laughs> I, uh, I think that who the chief planner of Vancouver is matters less than it used to, but it still matters. And from my perspective, I always uh, embrace, as Larry said, the, the, the power of, of, of inspiration and, and help. And when, when we did something in the center city, I always felt that it in some way was making it an easier task for the suburbs to, to take it on if they wanted to as they urbanize, whether it's issues like secondary suites as of right or, or, or laneway housing or, or just density around transit or what have you. Um, the power of inspiration or for paving the way, we always tried to document our packages, our, our approaches, so that if the mayor of one municipality, who frequently did, mayors would call us up and say, we're thinking about that, we send all our information out there and we try to be helpful. I'd say more and more uh, the opposite potential is there. I was the consultant for um, uh, New Westminster on the, the housing policy for families, and the new policy is 20% uh, uh, two-bedroom and 10% three-bedroom. Uh, which is now 25% and 10%, so 35%, which is more ambitious than Vancouver's. And very quickly, uh, the mayor uh, announced that he wanted to raise it in Vancouver. So we, uh, we actually talked in New Westminster about being an inspiration to the other, not only regional municipalities, but the center city as well, on, on who could have the most progressive policy around housing for families. So I think that inspiration can go in every direction. Yeah. Thanks, Mayor Stewart. Appreciate that. Uh, any other civic politicians or politicians at any level here? Well, again, thanks for coming, making that effort. Oh, and who are you? Uh, Matt oh, hey, Matt. <laughs> Good to see you. And North Vancouver District, yeah? Yes, that's right. 
I'm curious about the urban design aspect of the this, this city planning job and what the uh, future need and capacity of the city of Vancouver um, is. Good question. Uh, well, maybe I'll start. From a, there's, I've always felt that there was always a very strong urban design ethic and you didn't need a division called urban design, which they now have. What mattered was that there was a culture, that planning and urban design were one thing, and that many exercises that we do, whether it's uh, community amenity contributions or, or anything, always started with a design first kind of approach. And uh, folks like Scott Hine, uh, formerly the urban designer, have, have, have been quite candid about the fear that some of that's been lost. I know that on the part of staff, it hasn't been lost. The staff of the, the planning department and, and other departments as well that, that uh, planning works with, still strongly believes uh, in an, an urban design uh, is, a, is a bedrock of, of, of successful city making kind of approach. I think um, some of that's been lost in the disconnect with what the city management office has valued or even sometimes the politicians. But um, I think if we can, our new chief planner has to have an urban design uh, ethic an, earth, an urban design perspective, the ability to know good urban design when they see it, and, 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 um, and the alternative as well. Uh, I think that's a core con uh, component of the successful work. Rick? Urban design is uh, essential to any urban development at all, knowledge of urban design. And the knowledge of urban design is not just insisting that it happens, but actually forming it up in a way that people can understand why it's important. The old mantra of commodity firmness and delight, which I bore people with all the time, is it's got to work, it's got to be affordable, it's got to be comfortable, and it's got to be beautiful. Now in that, the city has a role not to design everything, but to make sure that anybody who brings anything to bear on the city is neighborly. You've all heard me talk about neighborliness before, that without neighborliness, this city, any city cannot work. And when it comes to neighborliness, it's both all the things we've been talking about, about process, but it's also about how do you design a building? And I've been affronted recently by the number of people who can come into City Hall and slap a high-rise in front of somebody else and not only put a thin one up, but they put the thickest one up they can find right in front of somebody who a few years ago thought they had a view. And that's being destroyed literally all the time now in this city because there's an absence of the idea of neighborliness and urban design is the root of good neighborliness. I, I was very naive on this topic because I thought all cities had an urban design ethic as you call it until I went to some other cities and realized they have no urban design ethic at all. While I believe that planning is inherently about three-dimensionality, four-dimensionality, it's not just about land use and transportation. It is about uh, urban design. And in fact, I discovered that the way that you can make planning work for people, given that we're all private, in, in our private lives are consumers and we want good products, and, and urban design brings that, uh, is to raise the bar of it all the time. Then when I went to other cities and found it wasn't going on, and no one seemed to even care about it, and no one even cared about the results very much, it was pretty frightening for me. Even though we've had some dramas recently, and Scott is one of my I, people I admire the most, uh, we still have a very high urban design culture here as compared to other cities. What we have to do is take care of it. Uh, we have to honor it. We have to uh, support it. Uh, and, make, and you, as, as citizens, have to demand it. Let me add a conundrum to this. I heard it in Dallas at the Revolution Conference, and you hear it more and more here. The fear of the better, the fear of good urban design, the improvements, the amenity. You provide that, that better transit service. You provide bike share. You put in that park. You actually make my neighborhood better. You gentrify it. You attract those who will drive up the rents. The new will make my existing accommodation more affordable. I'm right on the edge now. Stay away. Well, I've always taken the view, and I've had this conversation a hundred times here in Vancouver, that the, the terrible is still worse than the good, even though the good might have the tendency to rule some people out. In fact, what you have to do if, you, if you're aspiring to the good is have a much more strategic program to rule those people back in. 
And that's what we've forgotten. It's not that, that it's good urban design that has killed our, our social diversity. It's that a lot more people want to come here and we have no programs to help to accommodate all kinds of people. We don't do almost anything to accommodate middle-income people and support middle-income people. We barely support low-income people. So, and, and all the other kinds of issues, we don't do very much. And all around the world, people are doing a lot more than us on this. So you don't have to say either get good and cheap, I mean good and expensive, or terrible and cheap. Well, gee, I'd rather have terrible and cheap. Do you want to live in a slum? And I can tell you the people who are living in those slums don't want to live in those slums. And I think everybody on this panel, the design principles that lead to successful urban design do not have to, nor should they even be more expensive. That's one of those classic false choices that comes up in these debates about better city making. Because um, good design should in, almost be less expensive by definition if it's, it's good design. It's usually about how relationships happen, certainly not less so about the cost of materials and things like that. I will say, if there are any younger people here who are just starting their career, and you're not, you don't have a good urban design sort of sense in your head, don't totally give up hope. You either partner with somebody who has it, <laughs> or you make sure, knowing that that's not your strength, that you have a deputy whose strength it is. Because I've got to tell you, if my husband heard me talking, us talking about this, he would be laughing, rolling on the floor laughing because I have no aesthetic design at all. And Larry, you want to see Larry go white? That's when there's a development permit board meeting and Larry's on holiday and he thinks, shit, well, that's that planning word again. What will happen if Anne has to sit in my seat <laughs> on the urban design panel? He tried so hard to never be on holidays when the urban design panel met. So see, don't give up if you're she's not. building for effect. Yeah, don't give up if you're not. I see where the code came from and co-director. Hi. Well, I think it would be a really big loss for people of Vancouver not to hear from this, you know, hearing and getting exposure to this. So I really hope uh, this does get exposure. I think this, thank you so much for bringing this together. I mean, one needs to read the headlines tomorrow and probably see what was more important not having something from this. But hopefully we'll get the exposure it deserves. I have, uh, as the last person here standing, so I have uh, one comment, one question, one public announcement, <laughs> for good. Um, maybe I'll do the pu public announcement first about the Urbanarium. That is, as you are, very. it's working and it's going to be uh, having a relaunch, hopefully very soon, with the help of people on the panel, Scott High and uh, Leslie and other people around and yourself, I think. Um, so that was the public announcement. Oh, but man, the where? date, I can't, I can't say, but it will be hopefully soon. How will we find out if we want to? Um, website, urbanarium. Urbanarium.com. CA? It might be .ca, but I think it's .com, actually. Just put urbanarium. Just put urbanarium. Google knows it's all. It's .com. But okay. urbanarium, just you search urbanarium and you get... Uh, great. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, one event, but it will be, I'm sure, we're going to be more active and have a relaunch. So that was a public announcement. Thank you. Um, the comment was... Um, so I, I was sitting there and I just realized I had the opportunity to work at the city at a time that uh, all of you... So I worked at the city from 2005 to 2004, 2014, on and off. So I had the opportunity to work, actually, at Development Services. And when it became planning and Development Services under the new uh, manager of two. So I actually have worked under you at one time or the other. And also, I had Ray as a client at some point. So it's very interesting. I was sitting here. I'm like, hmm, I just, just clicked. And I realized the mood at City Hall, and this has, might have to do a lot with why maybe there's not enough interest now from the media tonight. What I was thinking, maybe, maybe that is the reason that you don't see enough interest in this hall from media, is because how the mood at City Hall has changed in, in the planning department, particularly for the last two or three years. Um, I'm not at City Hall anymore, so, um, but I was full-time, then I went back to school, so part-time I had the uh, opportunity to go back and check in every summer. So, but I realized how the mood has changed. And I think that has to do something, has something to do with 
how they might, there is no or not enough uh, media attention, you know, not enough interest maybe. And, uh, and I think partly it comes from the comment that Brandon had, maybe there's not enough trust or trust has been broken between the city and uh, people, citizens. So the question I have to moving forward and on a more optimistic note is if you assume we're going to get that uh, um, strong character, you know, that person um, on the chair and become as a city planner and hopefully as a director of planning and not just the manager of development services. Um, what do you think after listening and learning, what do you think the first big move should be that the new director of planning should make? Thank you. And that sounds like an actually pretty good question to end with. So we're going to ask you to answer that and to make any other final comments you'd like to add as well. Well, I'll start and end first. Um, I think the new planner working with the whole planning department team, by the way, these are some of the smartest people on the planet as planners. Uh, I think the new planner has to take forward to council a very uh, progressive, proactive agenda of planning. Right now, most, I don't think most citizens even know what the planning department is doing or care what the planning department is doing. And it's because, you know, we used to go every year and do an evaluation and we used to tell them what we're going to do the next year and everyone would get very excited and they'd all argue about it and then we'd agree and off we'd go and do it. I think the new planner has to say uh, with his, her or his team, here's what we would like to do for planning in Vancouver over the next year or five years. Uh, we want to go and get political embracement, endorsement of that, and then we want to move forward to do it. And yeah, we'll figure out how to do the money and all of that, but let's start with a, just a strong sense that we've got to fix the planning malaise that is underway right now. And that will come by that planner putting that for, strong for, uh, uh, program forward. And then second, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, and I hope you'll only remember it, which is the new planner does have to go and talk to Vancouver. Wait, I agree with Larry. Yeah, I agree with Larry. <laughs> well, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I could tell this was going to be a pretty extraordinary evening just because of the engaged conversation that you were holding. I mean, literally conversation. And, and I've been at this game long enough to know when I can hear or see the interest and the intensity, and I could certainly feel it in this room tonight. It was, I think, a reflection of the frankness and the honesty and the insight that you all provided. That was extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you very much, not only for that, but all the service that you've given to this city that you so love. I appreciate it. So carry on, carry on, <laughs> converse among yourselves. <laughs>